In this video, we are going to talk about folding, maybe the most important operation you can do on a list or other data types in Haskell. Okay, so let's look at what folding is. Uh, right here in the beginning, we will look at fold R, meaning fold right. After that, we will also take a look at another function called fold left, but let's see what we have here. Fold R takes one function as its first argument. This function has some type, well, has two arguments. Um, one is the type A and one is the type B, and it also returns the type B. After that, fold R gets an argument B and a list of type A, and it returns something of the type B. So fold R is defined as the following. You have some operation, whatever that might be. It has to be a binary function, of course. And then you have some starting value, A, uh, sometimes also called the accumulator. It depends on in what context f uh, this folding is used. But let's just call it a starting value for now. And then you have a list uh, going from x1 to xn. And fold R is just the combination of all the values with that binary function and its starting value. You need that starting value, of course, because otherwise you couldn't do the last function call uh, since you need two arguments for this binary function. Um, and for example, if we only had uh, a list containing one element, we couldn't do this function call. Okay. So now the question might be, why is this important and why would we use this? Well, you see here that... Any combination of all the elements of a list can be done with a folding. And not only that, because since this B type in the type signature is not the same as uh, the type of the list, you can do all sorts of things. And we will uh, see some examples what can be done with folding. Okay. So maybe let's look at one of the most, well, one of the most prime examples for folding, uh, creating the sum. Creating the sum of all elements of a list can be done with plus and the starting value zero, because then we compute the sum one plus two plus, well, whatever, plus n plus zero. So... Using partial function application, you can very quickly build the functions sum and an or. Right, just go, uh, well, just go through it uh, in your head. Uh, if we supply a list to these functions, what will happen to them? So now the question might be, what if I want some other function in there, a function I don't already have, because uh, we have just seen the usage with plus and the boolean or and and. But what if I want to build my own function for this? How do I have to think of it? Well, the function you give to fold R gets as its first um, as its first uh, argument gets one element from the list, and after that the accumulator. And that, of course, um, has to result in a term or expression that returns the type of the accumulator again. Then you get some starting accumulator, whatever that might be, and after that, the list. Okay, so for example, you want to build a function count, which counts how often a certain element is within a list. Uh, so here, count e, the e is the element we want to count. And here we see how this can be done with fold R. We have this anonymous function in there, uh, x and ACC. ACC, of course, is the accumulator. x is the element of a list. And we say, well, okay, if E equals x, then we increment this accumulator and give it back. And otherwise, we give back the unchanged accumulator. And what starting accumulator should we use? Well, obviously, zero, because if we never increment it, it should stay at zero since the uh, element was never found. Okay. Also, um, a function like this uh, is all can be written uh, with a fold R. Here we see two examples, one using the dollar sign operator 
and one writing it out a bit more clearly, I think. Well, it depends on your uh, definition of what clear and elegant looks like. Um, so this function uh, tries to find out whether all the elements in a list are a given element E. Um, this could have also be done with a uh, mapping and the AND uh, function. But here, when we do it in one function call with fold r, we don't have to iterate over the list twice, but only do it once. So the funny thing about folding is that a lot of functions we know and love and use when it comes to lists can be built from those foldings. So that is why folding is so important, because if you can define a folding on any data type, you immediately have, for example, like you can see here, a length and a map function. That just... In instantly uh, occurs to you, or doesn't occur to you, but it, it instantly falls into your hand once you can define such a folding. So we see here, for example, um, with the fold R uh, in length, we ignore the X that we get and simply increment the accumulator done with partial function application. This is done a lot that you want to um, ignore one uh, argument in a function and if you want to do that you can use this const function with the dollar sign so let's compare those two um, if you want to ignore this first uh, argument here in the anonymous function uh, just using this const function will do the trick now this const isn't as expressive in my opinion but it, it is sometimes used especially in the combination with folding which is why I wanted to uh, highlight it here yeah and a mapping can also be done with fold r uh, by doing a function uh, combination of f and the append uh, or not append, but prepend uh, constructor of a list. Okay. Now, direction is an important topic when it comes to folding because we've just seen fold r, but there is another function called fold l, uh, meaning fold left. And the important thing when implementing anything in fold l is that the accumulator and the element arguments are switched within the uh, function you give to this folding. This is very important and often leads to bugs that, uh, or not bugs, but type errors that you simply can't get rid of. Most of the time it's because you have the element and the accumulator switched. So when comparing fold R and fold L, we can see the following. Fold R builds a term, a recursive term, that in the end, as its first operation, does, in this example with the list 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, does the F5Z call. And after that, it does an F4 call on the result of whatever this F5Z was. So if you think about the order in which elements are treated in Fold R, it is done from right to left, which is why this function is called fold right. So you start with the last element of the list and then build your way up to the first. Fold L is the exact opposite. Fold L means you start with the first element of that list and then, you know, build your way to the end. Okay. Now maybe let's look at folding of another data type since it is... Well, important to see that folding can be done on other data types too, and that actually gives us uh, a lot of flexibility. Because as we have seen, you can build, for example, a length function or a map function or uh, whatever else from a folding. So if you define a folding on a tree, you get all of these functions for free, basically. Okay, but the question is, how does a folding on a tree look like? Well, there are different possibilities, of course. You could do it in order, like this, where you uh, treat the elements in the order from left to right, which would be a sort of fold left. But you could also do it in a post order, where you go from right to uh, uh, left. 
Or you could do it like this in this sort of pre-order notion where you go through the elements in this zigzag way, basically. Now, the question is, what is a correct folding of a tree? And that, uh, well, that question cannot really be answered. It depends on what you need your folding function for. In Haskell, in general, it is not relevant in which way or in which order we process certain things, since we're in a lazy evaluated language, meaning that it shouldn't be relevant whether we first look at four and then two, or if we do it like here, where we first look at the six and then the five and then the four. Because whatever term we are building, it should evaluate to the same thing. Uh, we are in a language that treats functions as purely mathematical functions after all. But of course, if we want to print this tree, then we work with constructs that we haven't seen uh, before. But also when we print things, it's actually important what order we do things. So it always depends on your implementation, whether you want to use a fold R or fold L, or if you want to define a folding on a tree in a pre-order, post-order, or mix-order, or whatever you want to have. 